we'll make it very official here. <laughs> yes. Well, it's not the business people, but this, but this panel about the future of WesterCon is now in session. We are recording. <laughs> as I, uh, as I was saying, this, this panel is being recorded. This panel is yes, okay, yeah. This panel is being recorded. The recording will be posted to YouTube, and uh, I intend to, as the administrator of the website, have it up on westercon.org for the interest of people who are uh, interested in this. Uh, there is the recording is also is on the soundboard, but the microphone for the camera is actually located in the top of the camera. So I got to remember to if people have questions, do we? remember to repeat them or actually have you, if you're interested, come up here and actually talk into the microphone so it's very hearable. I am Kevin Stanley. My pronouns are he, him, and I'm the moderator of this panel. Um, I, 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 I'm the moderator of the panel. You are? Yes, okay. He has an M, right? Oh, there it is. I'm sorry. I'm not looking at my instructions. Uh, uh, I should look at it. I was the chair of the last WesterCon, that, the uh, standalone WesterCon that was actually held, and that was last year's WesterCon. Uh, WesterCon 74 in Tonopah, Nevada. No, it was not a hoax. No, it was not a dream. No, it was not an imaginary story. It was an actual WesterCon, and 158 people did attend it, some of whom are in this room. <laughs> okay, and uh, I'm going to go to our right, then introduce yourselves and give your background. Well, uh, my name is Arlene Busby. I'm the president of the Aerospace Legacy Foundation and the vice president of uh, National Space Society Oasis local chapter. Um, I was also the chair of Los, Los Con, sorry, of WesterCon 75, which unfortunately we did have to cancel, which we will go into, and uh, sadly. And as a consequence of that, that's why all of you are now attending WesterCon 75 right here. Mm -hmm. Charles? I'm Charles Galloway from Salt Lake City, Utah. Been to about 10 Western ponds and somewhere between 50 and 100 conventions, I suppose, for the past 50 years almost. So I've been in Salt Lake fandom for about 50 years. Now, had this convention, been, had this panel been held on the first day of the convention, it would have been meeting a certain bylaws requirement that we didn't need to worry about too much because nobody filed a bid for WesterCon uh, two years hence. Uh, I, but I was going to suggest that, Charles, that you take the first 15 minutes uh, the way we would have done so had it been done on, on Friday to talk about your WesterCon coming up next year. Yes, I am the chair for WesterCon 76 in July 4th weekend. And I was, um, went through the uh, bid process in John Paul as the unopposed bid, and we happened to win, unfortunately. <laughs> so there were no bids filed early enough, and I think that Kevin was probably fairly nervous about that. Well, yes, I, when, when you're running the business portions of it, you're really nervous when no bids filed. Okay, the, the, uh, they, uh, no bids filed before the deadline to be on the ballot, but Charles's bid for Salt Lake was filed uh, and ran as a write-in. There's a lot of complexities and technicalities that we don't really need to go into unless you're really curious about them. But if you were there at the convention, you already know, so don't worry about that. And the net result was that you were awarded right. the Western Cup. It, it was about June, and it was like, I had a dream one night that um, I was sitting in a room with my science fiction fans. We closed down our condo convention after about 25 years in 2015. And we didn't really have a regular convention. And in the dream, I said, well, you know, we're all talking about it's time to do another convention. And I looked around the room, and I was the only guy standing up. And I woke up, and I said, I don't know what cons do. I don't think they have a bit there. So I started calling Mike Wilma and Kenny uh, Stanley was tracking everything. I said, yeah, there's still an opening for 2022, 23 and 24. And so they said, well, we think we have somewhere for 2023. Um, I bid for 2024. And so. I'll give you more chance to prepare. Okay. Yeah. So you had, you know, you had the bid. You had the, you had the full two years actually. 
Tell us about the convention itself, the dates and the location and the guests and that sort of thing. It is uh, not downtown Salt Lake City like the 2014 was, or not in Layton like the 2019 was, which was in Aspic. It will be just west of Salt Lake City proper, right by the airport. So it's about a 10 minute free shuttle van service from the airport for a modest sized hotel. I kind of expect a little less than 500, so, um, based on our budget and our expectations. And right by the I-80, uh, as you go out of Salt Lake City. So it's not going to feel like you're in the city. But we do have food, there's roughly a dozen or so restaurants, and I say restaurants are loosely, there's bars, restaurants uh, that are based around this sort of semi-industrial area. Hotel, restaurant, bar, service, coffee service, right in. And so that's open seven days a week. There's a few restaurants that are closed on Sunday or some Saturday and Sunday. But uh, I saw a lot of food in the $20 range. Um, walking distance between 5 and 15 minutes away. 15 minute walk can be pretty far, but you know, you can drive that far in a very short time. Yes. We have yes. <laughs> Steve Barnes and another you do. And they're well known around here, I'm sure. And CJ Lawson is a brand new writer. We thought we're gonna have a YA author who's new, kind of just because we have a lot of new writers in Utah in the last couple of years. We want to say, you know, this is what can be happening. He, he knows some of the uh, more experienced writers in Utah. And, Chumming his way around, probably like to like the universe, everything. I don't think it's been conduit. And kind of bring in some young flavor. You know, Steve Barnes has been with these uh, more. Uh, Western Con has had a lot of really good writers, but some of them are kind of older now. So we want to have both. So there was, a, I know there was a delay in determining the actual site we were going to hold the convention at. Yes. Uh, yes. Signed recently. Just to sign recently. Uh, I haven't looked this weekend. Uh, have you had an opportunity to update the website yet? Or is it still yes, updated? the website has been updated this weekend. I've checked it. Right. I'm looking at my computer. It is updated. And we did have some internal conversations with members of the committee on whether it be downtown Salt Lake City or the airport. This airport facility is very affordable. Can easily afford the hotel. Um, it's up to everybody out here in fandom to help pay for the hotel rooms because we do have to have hotel rooms rented out in order for us to break even. Uh, that's right. And what uh, I don't think I heard you say, what are your room rates? It is 189. 189, I missed that. So Salt Lake City feels expensive. I was warned way back by the Tony era from my hotel friends that. Hotel rates are higher than they were like your time. They are, yes. Yes, to get room rates of two digit numbers, you have to come to places like Tonopah, where one of our hotels had a room rate lower than the cost of parking in this hotel <laughs> per night. <laughs> oh, that was the world famous clown motel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's called the Boutique Historical Hotel. Yes. Was it 89? 89? No, no. The, the, the most expensive rooms in Tonopah were the the low 100, the low 100s yeah, at the right. Mizpah, and, yeah. and, and uh, that's okay. But, it is sort of but a it's, trade-off. But that's Tonopah, okay? <laughs> it's in Salt Lake City, yeah, okay. It's Salt Lake City, you're going to pay, and, or in any major metropolitan area. We are. Know, but 189 was the, is the headline figure. Yes. We are roughly a 10-minute complimentary van ride from the hotel to the airport, the international airport. So it's a trade-off. So you don't have to rent a car, and, and, get around, and yeah. if you drive there, do, do they have free parking? Yes, yeah, free parking. Free parking, yeah. Free yeah. service parking, not $60 a night at the way it's a downtown right. area. Yes. Uh, the other question is, uh, you have just now uh, updated recently your facility. Do you, do you know when uh, room reservations will open? I do not know that yet. Okay, so but it is a little early. It is a little early, early but it, there's something. Sometimes they open as early as like 11 months. I just I, I kind of warn you. I don't think your hotel is on your page yet. 
Uh, no, it's on one of the pages. Yeah, it's... It, they just, we're just cleaning it up this week, right? Oh, wow. And that's the reason why. A little bit, a little bit of stuff that needs to be done. Yeah, there was some housekeeping internally that we okay. had to take care of. Yeah, so that's all. <laughs> sweep up the ashes. Yeah. All right. Uh, if you uh, if, go ahead and continue your statements if you have them, we'll, otherwise we'll take some questions. We can take questions. Okay. Chris. If I book through Hilton Gallon at a better rate, does the convention get credit? If, okay, if, I'm repeating it for the benefit of the micro. If you book your, the hotel room directly through uh, Hilton, because it's a double tree by Hilton, would the convention get credit for the room nights? Do you know? I will have to double check. So I've that's been one of your, by that, yeah. you know, for the last 20 years I've been warm, and yet we haven't have that written in. Yeah, so you'll need to watch for that. That's yep. on your list, and, okay? Uh, that has been a case in many years that we've had to double check. Uh, is there another question? Before we go on. Because I was going to, what I want to do is, is to deputize you for a moment because all that, I, I, I'm still dealing with all that coffee I had at breakfast, so I'm going to run the bathroom now. Okay. okay. <laughs> so um, I know a lot of people are probably curious what happened to Wester Pound 75. Thank you. Yeah. I catch you. I got you. Um, so now that you're all in front of me, uh, I've said it on the website um, and so forth. It was a sad moment because I had big plans for 75. Um, we just didn't have the membership. I mean, we had a $20,000 bill to pay the hotel, and we were nowhere close to paying that. I, we were lucky if we got half. So at, at some point, I had to make a, an adult decision. Um, to shut it down because at that point the, sh the cancellation rate at the hotel was only $2,000. If I had waited until 30 days prior and I knew the numbers couldn't climb 300 people in that one month, then um, we would have been stuck uh, with a $3,000 cancel. And if I'd waited even longer than that, we would have gotten hit with the full 20 plus $1,000. So um, I consulted with uh, the Laskas, and uh, they said, we're doing the right thing, cut the cord, send everybody back their money, and call it a day. And that's what I did. Now, I don't know if anybody here had a membership. Hopefully, you got your refund. Did you all get your refund? I sent it to you. Uh, yes, for those of you who graciously donated your Memberships to help pay the bills because of that two thousand dollar bill we had, it helped tremendously. So much so that if you come to closing ceremonies, hopefully we can arrange it at closing ceremonies. I will be giving this gentleman a nice check. Oh, good. Uh, we also had a uh, lot of uh, we had a personal donation by someone who also helped pay the bills and. Most of the, we, thanks to the generosity of everybody who donated to us, we were able, at the request of the person who donated, to give this convention four thousand dollars as a donation to help pay the bills. So yeah, we're doing okay. However, there were some people who did not cash their checks. We will contact them because all of a sudden I think we should have thirteen hundred dollars in our account. Why do we have seventeen hundred dollars in the account? Because it didn't make sense. And I talked to my treasurer, and it looks like some people didn't cash their checks, so being a credit union bank, they put all the money back in the account. So now we have to find those people, and we have to say, uh, we can issue you new checks, but you have to verify your address, this, that, and the other. Some people have approached me here already about it. Um, maybe got lost in the mail, maybe what, for whatever reason it didn't you lost it or whatever, we, um, we will deal with all that. In the end, the bank account will eventually be zero. To make you feel better, Tonopah has the same problem. We still have some people. Yes, Kevin was telling yeah, me. So don't feel out of it. We're in the same boat. We yeah. hope to be able to clear that. I'm an efficient soul. I want a zero balance. We do too. And if we can clear it, we will pass it along. May well, I? that's good. And that's what I'm doing here because uh, the person donated to us. Uh, 
a lot of money came here, and the rest will go there. So um, we're holding on to some of the money to make sure that the checks are taken care of. So if you did not get your refund of that, let me know so we can verify where where we sent it. But that'll take a while because our treasurer needs to deal with it. The um, it, it's just my concern is because of the numbers. I mean, we we. Uh, we got some memberships at uh, Western on 74, but their numbers were low in, in the first place. And I thought I did really well. We picked up almost 150 people. Um, then lost con, we picked up some more. And then I said, in order to break even, we need to have 400 to 500 people. We weren't even half there. So that's what happened to me, <laughs> sadly. So now, WesterCon being a travel and convention ha and historically has gone through a lot of different sizes of event. I mean, it's been as high as 2,500 back in the 80s. That was back in the 80s. Though. It was, yes. Okay, there are reasons why these things happen. And, and as low as 158 uh, in, in attending, as opposed to total membership, about 350 or thereabouts in Tonopah. And also it was a fairly low membership turnout when it was in Hawaii. Um, that sort of thing. So they just did all over the place, yes. Yeah. Next, Carol. Well, I want to jump on this topic real quick here. SpikeCon, Layton, NASPIC, WesterCon 72, five years or four years ago, also had some surplus funds. I think they helped out Tomaha. They did, yes. And there's a little money left that they're um, using to help Utah in 2020. Four. That's right. They're, and, they're a wonderfully named uh, parent organization. The think about the initials, the Utah Fandom Organization. <laughs> so, so I don't want to spend it all because I'd love to have that fall of money go on to the next convention. But if all goes bad, we'll still have everything paid for because that money is there available for us to use, and we just want to have it to follow on future conventions. You know, we want to break even. We don't want to use that money for ourselves. But it does help our cash flow. Uh, you had a question. What, uh, what's your cost been having problems for quite a while? I think it was maybe five or six years. I think maybe even longer than that. When uh, the convention lost their hotels, they, the hotels dropped out completely and the lot of us thought that it was going to reverse since lot was started it reversed back to lot they don't want it they didn't want it no, they yeah, don't they want don't it. it's a little bit more okay the question about uh, there have been you're right there have been two of the last three western cons including this year the con the convention committee um threw in the sponge uh and said we cannot hold our western con uh, not last year, because we had ours in Dota Bob, but the year before that, um, SeaTac, I'm going to say Seattle, because it did, but it's actually in the city of SeaTac, the uh, group up there, um, they this would this would have been the first post-COVID uh, convention. We actually delayed all WesterCons by one year we, uh, because of the onset of COVID in uh, 2020. But even then, it was... They did not believe they could hold the convention under those circumstances. There were too few people involved. They could basically, I think they could exit their contracts due to force majeure issues and something like that, if I'm not mistaken. And so Seattle withdrew. And what happens in those cases after a site has been selected and running like that, if the convention committee can't figure out anything to do, then it does in fact the responsibility for doing something is handed to WASPAS. In both that case and this year, uh, Lospis chose to present to add the convention to LOSCON. It is the simplest solution, and that's why we've had these situations. There also was a case back in 2011 where there was a legitimate bid on the ballot. Okay, it was a Portland bid. They were a serious bid, a filed bid. But one of the things we've learned is that just, even if you're running unopposed, there's no guarantee that you're going to win if you tick off the voters. If the, and in their case, they ended up with a situation where they couldn't muster the sufficient number of votes to win, and the WesterCon business meeting presented the committee 
a hoax bid effectively uh, was presented with the convention, and that's where the Sacramento West, the last Sacramento Westercon came from. All of Garden Convention. Yeah, they, they, no, not all of Garden, all of Country. Thank you. I know. I know. I've it, never heard that until I heard it from you. That's right. Um, it was a hoax bid for Granzella's Olive Country Restaurant in Williams, California, on Interstate Five. However, of course, they said, "Of course, we can't hold it there," and they ended up holding it in Sacramento under the auspices of San Francisco Science Fiction Convention Incorporated, which also was the nonprofit that, that was our parent for WesterCon '74, because SFSFC does that sort of thing. Uh, anyway, that there, you know, it's a case of there have been some rough spots along the road. It's not the those aren't even the first times that WesterCon had jumbled site selections, some before my time. But that's the past of WesterCon, and we're trying to talk more about the future. Oh, I, I remember a, a lady else rescued a WesterCon and put it in Burbank. I forget exactly. There have been those situations. Yeah. Jumped it there and acted like a normal WesterCon. Yeah. Well, I mean. I, Considering all of you are here in the audience, I would assume that you are Westercon fans. So, <laughs> I mean, thank you. Yeah, more like I know the basics of it. Westercon is not the same as it was when I first encountered it. My first Westercon, second Sacramento was 1985, I think. I can't have the numbers in front of me, but uh, which I think was my second science fiction convention that I ever attended. The first being L um, LA Con 2 in Anaheim. Okay, first ever science fiction convention. Uh, but WesterCon, and that was in Sacramento, and it was you know 1,000 plus people, I guess. I don't remember it's roughly. Um, and the convention has in fact fluctuated greatly in size and moved around. And it has changed a lot, and the conditions have changed. Okay. There are a lot more standing location conventions. Movable conventions are challenging. Even SMOFCON of only 150 people or so can be challenging. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Yeah, so, all right. I remember, I thought it was you who put in a, someone put out a really excellent hybrid program at Carnival. Well, you want to talk? Well, you were head of programming. We had, we didn't have, we had one, Room that I was, that was excellent. I was listening to people who were talking with their butts sitting in Africa while I was sitting. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, you they, want to talk they, about yeah. what we did in Tonopah, yeah. Um, yeah. That just had my phone. It was a suggestion. Um, uh, we knew there was uh, a okay. contingency of people who were attending who wanted to do early morning programs. They wanted to attend them, not be on them. And um, I wanted to start programming at 11. So, yeah. but but somebody wanted to get uh, some people involved from uh, writers that we would normally never get here or couldn't afford to get here to be a part of it. So we did a virtual program, a very successful program actually. There was people sitting there watching these people who like in the middle of the night for them, early morning for us, and 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 talk about things that we could never afford to have here. And so it was it, it was an extremely uh, difficult, excuse me, <coughs> this dry air in here, I'm sorry. Extremely difficult thing to coordinate because of the different time zones. It was challenging, but we pulled but it we off. But we made it happen. And, and I, as the chair of the convention, I, I want to say it, of that convention, one of the things I find quite, almost ironic or, or, or something like that, when we were bidding in 2019, no one had ever heard of this COVID thing. It didn't. Yeah, it, yeah. Now it was probably out there, okay. We, but we, it was not. It was not known. And but we had already said with the, our bid from Donovan because we knew we had great Wi-Fi in the convention center, uh, and that they were in the process of upgrading it, which they did by the time we got there, and so on. And we said, okay, we'll go ahead and commit to doing at least some virtual and online programming are uh, not a fully hybrid type convention to work in. We didn't really think of such a thing in those times. So all of our supporting members will be will be able to, if so a supporting member would have actually something to go for with their the, their $25 or $20 or what it was. And then and then the world changed in, in, tw in early 2020. And things got really weird. Uh, they still are. Uh, but we went on 
three years later, because we jumped forward a year and left a gap in the numbering, or not in the numbering, but in the, con in the conventions, and we still did the program. And people said, well, you know, this is just everybody does this now. And I said, yes, well, we said we were going to do it before everybody started saying that. We were ahead of the game on that. I'm very glad that we had both fully online programming, and which you're talking about there, and also we had one of our program rooms, which was set up as a, a hybrid uh, programming track. I'm, I'm right. suggesting that for future, let's say uh, the one in Salt Lake City is a little small, that you can have a tiny convention that had a wonderful international component. I can put you in touch with you. Um, FireCon, since COVID, has stayed, that's a convention that's been in Utah for writers and creators, has gone just online because they wanted a wider audience and just they could get in Utah. They wanted authors that they couldn't afford to bring in. And they're just staying online right now because they can. And um, World Fantasy in Utah, because of COVID, was all online. And that was a rush. Well, to get as far as being it. online, there's a, there, there's a generation issue with some things. With my organization, Arab Athletic Foundation, we have an older contingent of members. Um, I'm 71. Yeah, but you're not like my aunt who was on Facebook and email at 90 something years old. Some people choose not to get tech savvy like you and I. Right. Okay. But the thing is that um, <clears throat> a small contingent of people do not understand how to use Zoom, don't want to learn how to use Zoom and actually are prepared to say bad things about being totally online. I don't agree. Don't, don't put the pressure on me. I, I, I was happy to do the, the virtual programming. It was, it was a great experience. It was challenging, but it was a great experience, and these people were wonderful. You know, so before we move on... I just want to make a huge comment. Yeah. You got access to several authors who've never been to the United States. Yeah, that's my point. Yeah. It gives you access to authors who now either... Now they have American sales, and they have an outlet to yeah. send some books, XYZ stores, and several different parts of the United States mm -hmm. and sell their books directly. Yes. It made a huge difference. Oh, but yeah. There are authors oh, yeah. who cannot... Can't, who can't afford to come here, and some who are not allowed to come here. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So it was a it was a good alternative, a way of doing program. Yeah, something you might consider. Yeah, absolutely consider. Because, because yeah, the problem with doing it here at LostCon was finding somebody who was reliable enough to set it up. You have to have somebody who knows the tech. And and, and, and going on her point. I didn't buy any books because I generally go to my local library and I did read some of this African literature that I wrote down notes as this was going on, read some of their stuff. So, yes. Well, I mean, if well, we're going to keep Westercons going, we have to be more in yeah, in I mean, inventive. I have some other people who have been trying to get in here and I want to call upon them uh, 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 and then we'll try and get some of these other ones here because I don't want to spend the entire, whole convention on this one, uh, the whole panel of which we have about uh, 30 minutes left to on this one topic. Kevin? Yeah, well, the title of the panel is Is There a yes. Future for Westercon? And I guess I'm uh, I guess I'm kind of wondering why we think it was a struggle to get even 200 people to go to a Western kind of I have never been able to figure that out. I think it was the fact that Tonopah had low membership to start. I'm not blaming them for anything. It wasn't anybody's fault. Uh, people were just scared, scared of going to conventions because of COVID and, and their location, although it was wonderful. I loved it, by the way. Uh, the, 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 I think that that had part, partly to do with it. I think the low attend low membership by from, from the table we had here uh, last year uh, also did it, and I think there's some sort of uh, thing, something in fandom that's happening that uh, people are are not interested in doing WesterCon anymore. They don't want to attend. I, I know you have things to say, but I'm trying to call on some people who haven't actually spoken yet, so I'm going to get to. I, 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 I can't really continue, Kevin, definitively answer that. that question because it's something out of my knowledge. Well, I guess, I, I guess I'm, I'm wondering, I mean, just to, to follow, do we think that like two to three hundred is really a cap on the expectations that should be put on this future weather? 
Well, I think that coming out of COVID probably has some effect. Um, although people are anxious to see each other and greet each other and be around each other again, um, I think we're starting to come out of it, but maybe uh, there's still some fear in that. The, I, I mean, it could be indifference that's part of the problem. And it could be basically that people say, well, I don't want to go anywhere. I want to just go somewhere I can commute to, some very place right near me, and I, therefore I only go to I only go to my local convention. Yeah. Frank, frankly, I've, I've done tables sell at NorwestCon, and I don't want to, this is, I've had this happen elsewhere, but I want to give this example. Uh, trying to talk to people about getting a membership to the NASFIC that was going to be held a few blocks up the road at the Hilton Hotel, I think it was, and people said, but I go to NorwestCon. I said, well, yes, but it's just over here. So I go to this one convention once a year at this one place at this one time, and I don't go anywhere else. This isn't the only place I've run across that attitude. Money is tight. It isn't even money. It's just attitude. On it. I am not a science fiction general fan. I am a NorwestCon fan, or I am a Baycon oh, fan, true. I or I am a LostCon fan. This oh, yeah. is all I do. Uh, so that's where we see some of this coming from. Lisa, yeah. you had some. I, I want to bring up the point of the future of Western Farms. And I had a run in at Mr. Galloway's table, but he was not there. And I tried to excel Western Farm because I was standing there. And the person said specifically, well, it's not going to be around anyway, so I don't want to go. I am saying that part of the problem we're having is the perception that we're not there, not that we aren't there. But the right. perception, and we have a lot of talk about an ending, people take that's the only thing they hear. So if we want to go forward, we have to have both the willingness to run a convention, but to have people believe we're running it. The trouble I had with Tonopah was everybody thought it was a hoax. Matter of fact, when we were technically a hoax bid, I wasn't hoaxing. I knew I could run it. That was a previous bid a decade earlier. In 2012. Yes. So the point was, it took me another decade to get people to go, you mean you're serious? And I go, yes. And even then, Kevin says, people said, well, it wasn't really there. And there is sort of a thing, and forgetting about travel distances, admittedly, what we did last year at Paul was unusual. We, we don't deny that. But there is something I fear I hear out there. Remember me, before the panel, I talked about being from a small town in the northern, northern California. There was this sort of, I, got, I get this attitude from some people who said, well, unless you have a metropolitan area of at least one million people, you're not a real city. Nobody actually lives there. <laughs> That's larger than my county. I, I know that. I understand that, okay? Um, but, but there is some of that attitude to me that I don't think people believe it exactly like that, but they have a hard time, especially, doggone, Oh no, you city slickers! So, so, <laughs> says, I mean, my my hometown is a vill was a village of a few hundred people up in the mountains. Okay, so I, I did. All right. Um, yeah, I want to. I want to. Uh, yeah, you next. Hi. Um, so um, one thing that's kind of a, you know a hard situation. Um, I'm sorry, I missed. I missed I the beginning. One thing that's kind of a hard situation. I don't know whether it's been a, an issue with other major conventions, but I know that previously, 4th July was, was Westercon's, you know, dominant, you know, space, and now Baycon is You know, I heard you starting to speak, and I just realized that, yeah, I didn't mention Baycon being, being one of our biggest, I think, issues. Yeah, and, and, so. and Baycon had very legit, I, I'm probably going to wait to get back to you, because I've got, you, you can't see that there are people behind you when trying to speak to them. Baycon had to change its dates right. for well and obvious reasons. You can talk to them about it, but one of the biggest issues is having a 25,000 person anime convention right on top of them at the same dates. That did not, that has not helped. It hasn't They hurt. lost their hotel. They lost their hotel stuff. And NorwestCon apparently doesn't have nearly the same issue with their con their local anime convention. It doesn't seem to be as much of an issue. Um, so yeah, um, Baycon was not trying to kill a convention. It just moved. And that's and before I get to people's comments, I need to ask here: How many people here were at the WesterCon business meeting yesterday? All right. So I'm going to summarize as best I can for the rest of you. Yesterday at the Westercon business meeting, 
uh, the members of the meeting, and all of you could have been there, you all had other commitments, I know that. The meeting eventually voted to make some changes to the Westercon bylaws. They do have to be ratified next year to take effect. But to remove the recommendation that Westercon be held on 4th of July weekend, it's never been a hard and fast rule, you understand, but just was traditional. And change a bunch of technical rules that were essentially assuming it was always going to be that weekend and all the deadlines were based on that, to change it to all the rules will be based on the date of the convention itself. This makes it a much easier for a group that might want to bid a Westercon standing alone on, oh, let us say Memorial Day weekend somewhere, <laughs> or potentially to combine it with another convention like, who knows, the Baycon, or Norwescon, or whatever. Dragon Con. Or, uh, no, 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 not Dragon Con, <laughs> because 104 <laughs> degrees west, folks, that's as far east as you can go. Comic Con. But also, <laughs> <laughs> but also, if you look at the Where's history, your tomatoes, okay? If you look at the history of Westercon, it wasn't always on the 4th of July weekend. Yeah. So. The 1968 Worldcon was also the 1968 Westercon. Now, I was only three years old, but I know the rule. That's the last time the two conventions were combined. I might add, um, I understand that uh, the Seattle Worldcon uh, has no interest in hosting Westercon, so don't bother them about it, okay? <laughs> uh, so, we are in the process of, of Westercon evolving a little bit, perhaps. I mean, one path for Westercon, and it's one we discussed yesterday at the meeting, is retire it. We could say, and there are people in this room who I respect and make good cases for there being no, no future for Westercon, we should just shut it down, that it's, its purpose is passed, in which case it would just probably stop happening, unless, some, unless the owner of the service mark abandoned it and somebody else decided to pick it up. That's a different story entirely. However, there were enough people at the business meeting who at least felt there was at least still a chance for a future of it, so let's make some changes to it to make it easier for it to move around and possibly find a new future for itself as a regional Western convention. And I'll say, moving conventions that move from place to place every year are very challenging. Worldcon is a really hard convention to put on like that. Okay, Westercon is, is also difficult. It's much easier to hold the same convention in the same place with the same people every single year. Lofcon. Yes. What's the density of the, of the Western zone where we could put the convention and everybody would come to it Then we get into an argument on where that is. All right, um, I think that you have one. Yes, um, yes, you. I just wanted to make a comment. Now, I'm a vendor, so I'm usually not in business meetings or in yes. business. Yeah. But this year we're taking off from that. My experience of being successful as a vendor is having crossover from other conventions. That means that you have a costume event of some sort, or maybe two. The best lost con we ever did was the year they had a vampire ball. And it, Alice in Wonderland too. I made seven thousand dollars on fifteen hundred people making program. Diversity of programming brings dealers, dealers bring money, and we're happy to pay for our space there if we feel you have enough things. Because I sell books, but I also sell hats and costumes. And so, yeah, so you're saying you're 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 advocating for you know, Westercon, people planning to put them on it, good. it wouldn't hurt at all to combine it with other events and try and have some diversity and, yeah. and take the path. Because if there's, if there's a costume show, if there's anime crossover, and that brings young people into your show as well. Okay. And that makes the dealers remorseful. I'm going to ask Cliff for his comment. Yeah, and a serious one, please, this time. Thank you. That, is the, that is my plan. Thank you. Um, I did, I did want to <laughs> ask about the... Uh, you know, given the tone of power worked pretty well, the uh, viability of moving to non-hotel facilities where, where you're not highly trying to make a hotel block and so on and so forth. Um, my default is insert maternal organization here all, um, uh, you know, where, where you might have, you know, five or six rooms. Yeah, the, um, 
Tonus Spinosa is in fact something of a special case, I will say this. However, not a totally special case, it's just that um, uh, you may not be, people may not be familiar with such a thing. One of our, one of our staff for Tonopah was a, is uh, Randy Smith, who is from the Midwest, uh, but has moved out to this coast. He says, there's a lot of small facilities out there where you have similar, you've got community halls like this and there might be some hotels around and do something like that. This is a possibility. I think there's actually a future for different kinds of convention, where some of them you might have a, a, a group that, that wants to go out there and did a big convention and try and pump it up or join it with another convention. And there's also the chance of these relatively, if you like the word boutique events, where which are just a, summer smothcon has been a term you thrown around occasionally, a social occasion. And, and I think these all have equally valid futures, and, then, and I'd actually like to see a mix of them from year to year. Um, I, I looked away from this, did, I, I see your hand up, but you, did you have a, did you have, okay, I may, I, I may have missed seeing it. Okay, yes. Um, so I remember the Vancouver Western Forum. Vancouver, yes, they Western Forum 44. Uh, some uh, university uh, facilities involved. Yes, it was at the University and, of British Columbia. And so that might also be something where uh, I'm, you know, personally, my, my sideline is student housing near USC. And I know that in the summertime, a lot of universities, you know, have an abundance of facilities because summer enrollment is lower than year-round enrollment. That's right. There are other facilities. Out. I actually would like to say... I don't think a lack of facilities is a problem. There are piles of facilities of whole varieties of sizes that can host this event. What is an issue is people willing to do the work to make those facilities work. Okay, uh, yeah. I just, I just want to say, I, I don't think we're complaining about the lack of facilities. I think we're more getting at the fact that there's a target fixation on hotel with convention space. Yes. That, that is a very much a possibility. Continuing your point, if you would. Yeah, sorry. Um, I was just also going to say that given that these you know, facilities do get tend to be underutilized during the summer, they might not hold you to such onerous terms if you don't hit certain targets. Yes, there may be possibilities to make these facilities well, work. It just I, needs some better. Right, we'll can continue can on that, and then I'm going to move on to others. Um, one of the problems for for lost time. Uh, for example, and I've done a few programming for Western Commons before, and so it's a universal issue, is staleness. Um, you, this year I tried to bring new people in to the program, so hopefully that helped to get a different view and, and, and fresh ideas. The problem isn't so much getting the people here, it's finding people to work the convention to make it happen. If you have to do it by yourself, things are not going to work out as well. So whether it's a Westercon, a Lostcon, a Worldcon, or any convention, you have to have the staff to make it work. Um, a lot of people they, they choose to be part of, uh, to be uh, riders on the train rather than controlling the train itself, and that's fine and dandy. We'll find people eventually that will help us. But if you want these kinds of conventions to continue, we need people to step up and take some responsibilities to help us make it happen. There is that. And as it dies and you get less and less people willing to stand up, or the people who do run them start to croak, <laughs> you know, leave this mortal coil, um, the, the conventions will slowly die. There's well, just no other... And, and before I call, and you've got a point about what I want to say, and before we go on to another person, I'm saying, I, I think we are facing what I sometimes have seen called the bowling alone problem. The, the, uh, which, uh, the lifetime of many of some social groups, I believe the term is about, th about three generations, is about as long as you, and we are therefore in past three generations into the lifetime of this social group called Western Time. Uh, they don't necessarily mean, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to die, but it means there's work and there's an issue there involved. It is a social and cultural issue. Linda. I just want to point out that there's also the, the idea that a lot of conventions have that play the numbers game. The more people they have, the greater the success of the convention. But that's not necessarily true. There's quality over quantity. 
Yeah, and running a smaller convention with fewer people having to run the convention and bringing in a smaller number of people, usually it's people who know each other and can be more convivial and you don't need 50 million tracks of programming because there's a common interest. Yes. I mean, there's, I mean, there's been other conventions who have approached me over the years to train new people to do programming because they were starting a new convention or, or they, the people who used to program no longer wanted to do it and they needed somebody to replace them. I'm happy to do that. I, I don't mind training people to do the programming because it's, it's, I teach them like I used to be a trainer. So I teach people the way I would do it and then I say, go run with it, make it yours. So it's, it's just getting those people to step up and volunteer and learn that in all the departments that it takes to run a convention, no matter what size you are, and, and getting the next generation to move and step up to take over for those, those of us, well, I'm not saying me personally, but some people who wish to retire and not, no, longer, no longer be the institutional memory, to just care, share that information and move it on to the next generation. We have about 15 minutes left. No, um, we don't. We don't? I thought we did. No. No, it's a, it ends at uh, 12.45. Oh, I thought it was half past. Okay, so we got a little more on that. <laughs> You've been so patient, and I know you've been wanting to make another comment here. And then yeah. Like, um, one of the things is on promoting cons, uh, there are people like, uh, I don't know if you know who Mo, Mo Kelly is on KFI, but he talks constantly about uh, comic books and stuff. The, the, the people at Oscars didn't want to promote uh, last con, maybe because he they said, no, we keep comic, comic book people. But that would bring other people in, and there are probably other, like, radio type of stuff. It's, 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 it's how promoting to the right audience is what you want to do. Uh, I know when we were promoting, we, for, for our kind of our Western con, things were really crazy, of course, because we really couldn't travel as much and sit at tables because we got COVID and conventions weren't happening. Lost con, perhaps, where you know, conventions just weren't happening. The, the way I'm used to promoting stuff is sitting at a table and promoting to the same old, same old, okay? Uh, I was doing a lot of online programming. I must say that the Nevada Silver Trails, their Twitter feed, back when Twitter wasn't toxic, uh, or well, wasn't as toxic, let us say. Uh, but the Nevada Silver Trails were really happy with us because we kept retweeting their stuff, and then they started promoting us because we thought we, they thought we were pretty cool. They they loved our newsletter, our newsletter. But the, the, what I'm getting at with that is that there's no one for WesterCon. There's no one right way to run it. And you have a very good point here. I think Lisa's been like, yeah, he wanted to say something else. I wanted to go back to facilities. The yeah. only reason I found Tonopal was accidental. I've been to, I don't know how many smock cons, I've been smocky too long. And me and Kevin have gone out to dinner at a hotel somewhere and start planning a convention just out of habit. It's con runner disease. And so I did this in Tonopah and figured out that it would work. And nobody believed me until I got Kevin in the front door and he went, my God, it would work. Yeah. I want to point out that if you want to do something, you want to be a little different, it requires going out and looking. A classic example that I want to point out is for years, one of the most silly hoax bids, not silly, it's silly because it isn't. And that was the Roswell bid for Worldcon. Roswell, New Mexico, And Worldcon people laughed, bid, except that which Roswell- Which was actually on the ballot once. I Roswell know. handles 25,000 person UFO convention. They have a facility that can handle 300 people or 25,000 during those time months because it's a university facility that empty and they love the piss out of selling it out to anybody. And the Gary Museum is there. Yeah. So Oops. if you look at doing something that's questionable, go out and look around and say, what would be fun and get your other friends and other people to do it. And I want to point out something I'm so pleased about Tonopal. One of the people, my friends, I talked them into being in charge of fixed function things. They did a good job. I had nothing to do with the next step. Somebody said, I want you for Pentacon. The NASPIC. For, for, for those who don't know. And they moved on to do something else. So it's 
it's still within us to get new people, younger people, in on the first step and have them go up the ladder. It's just a question of making a little effort. And I think our real problem with, with Western Fund right now is still a jitter. It's a very bad jitter that happened, and I think we can smooth it out and go that way if we try. And without denying that the convention had been up and down, we had 800 people in Sacramento a decade ago. And the, 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 up and because it by the way, it's not going to be a consistent attendance if you're going to measure on that because it moves around because it's a different group every year. Okay, you don't have the same measuring stick as you have for a same place, same time every year group. Cliff, another another you want to make another crack at it there? Yeah, I mean, I understand what you're saying about there's no one way, one right way to run a WesterCon. But I am concerned that if, if WesterCon does not end up with some sort of, you know, shtick or resume to tear, it, you know, it doesn't have a brand of some sort, i.e. it's a summer small con, it's a relaxed con, something else. Itself. You know, if, if it's something wildly different, okay, it moves around and has different con com every year, that's that one challenge, but if it doesn't have a brand as well of some sort, yeah. even within fandom, okay, I'm going to this year's WesterCon, is it going to be a relaxed con or a comic con? That's a very legitimate concern of branding because Westercon is all over the place. I'm not going to deny that. It, even before the uh, road the, 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 the roadblocks we ran into after 2019, it, it, you just never quite knew. This is something of the responsibility of the people putting it on. I think I like to believe we communicated well on exactly what we were going to do in Tone Upon. We didn't, it, by the way, if it, I know there were at least a, a handful of people who actually made the trip. I'm going to tell this story before I go on it, because this is something you got to watch out for. One, we did, most of the you know, 158 people, most of them had a pretty good time. I was really happy as a past Worldcon chair that there were a total of seven past Worldcon chairs at 158 person convention. That's where you that that's a little unusual. You wouldn't expect it out of the middle and of the And four on staff. <laughs> that's it. Um, well, yeah, we were, I remember because a bunch of us were just sitting up on the front of the stage chatting, come and talk, that's good, you had a good time. But one person in particular, and I'm not going to name names, okay, but they complained at me after the convention, and I may be misrepresenting their complaint. I admit that freely, that's so why I'm not going to name names exactly, but I got the impression that it worked out to say, why are all these old people here? I have been going to WesterCon for 30 years, and when I came to WesterCon, it was full of young people. Where did they all go? Now, yes, and I think, and I think that I, the lack of self-awareness was staggering to me. I, I really wish I could have said, you're saying you haven't changed, but everybody else has gotten old. You know? Sounds like a class reunion. Yeah. Okay. Look, I know. I mean, I... My first science fiction convention, I turned 19 years old in the convention. I'm 58 now. I try not to forget. <laughs> I know, I know, I'm one of the, I'm one of the youngsters. Okay. There is that, I'm not gonna, this is not a grand fandom panel, okay? But, and by the way, Tonopah in particular was a case of, well, gosh, you had to have enough resources to make it there. So it was more likely to have us people who had a little bit more money to make the trip. Yeah, you gave us some adventure. I had to give you props. Did you like that? Yeah, it was an adventure. Was, yeah. it a, was it a good adventure? Yeah. That's the important part. Yeah. <laughs> good. Well, one of the things that we touched upon yeah. is that with WesterCon moves from location to location, whereas, let's say, for example, Lost Con in Cooper next year, uh, stays A three close, block move is not yeah. a move. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the chairs change every year. Yeah. The, the staff changes mm -hmm. mostly, not, not all of them, but. <laughs> Um, programmer changes every year, um, so forth like that. But because they're established in a location, it's more stable. Whereas <laughs> at Westercon, what my biggest problem was, was to find a hotel that would take us for a reasonable price because yes. they didn't know who we were. They and when you try to find, and, and this is another thing you might want to address this in the future, is, is to show a history of previous conventions that pass on to chair to chair, so when they try to find a hotel, they have a history of to present to them to, that we are a stable organization, yeah. that we've had this many people at the convention, and we've had that at this hotel, and we've been in this state, and we had this, because the problem with, with the Western Cons as they stand right now, everybody 
reports on their own con, but they don't always provide all the information, like their numbers and stuff. Yeah. And it makes it very, very difficult to find a hotel that will take them. Charles, you want to address I, that? Well, well I found this a little amusing because I went to the uh, airport Hilton Doubletree, and I had my old file from 20 years ago where I was hotel liaison for that exact same hotel in the original hotel folder. <laughs> I said, well, we're doing something like a lot like this. And it's really that is a real problem what you're talking about, though. Okay, is because uh, it's, uh, it is the work, by the way, WorldCon has exactly the same problem, but this is written about two orders of magnitude smaller. Okay, because, okay, WorldCons are one to two million dollars in turnover. Um, our Tonopah, which is low end, was about $14,000. And half of our quarter of that was uh, donations and grants. 17, dear. 17? 17, oh, and five of it was okay. donations. Okay, there you go. I'm sorry, you, you, you've read it more recently than I have. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so. I mean, that's something that needs we to be addressed. Don't, and the event is so variable that it's very difficult. And, and as you say, not people don't keep these kind of records. Or don't share them. Or don't them. share them. I don't think that it's. Uh, it's not that they don't want to, it's just, oh, well, we're done. You know, sort of forget about these things. Well, that's yeah. Something. There is that. Element. I mean, I haven't shared mine yet. Well, there but you then go. I canceled. So. Yeah, well, that makes it a negative. Uh, yeah, but you don't yeah, want that thing. No, you don't want that. Linda. Well, what Charles said is very interesting that the, the hotel actually had your records because one of the problems, even with with you know conventions that go in the same place year after year after year, is the convention manager, the hotel managers, the, mm -hmm. the banquets uh, manager, move around. They don't stay consistent. Oh, there's there's a lot of. Year. Over so hotel. Hotel. You, you, your we hotel. have that in Tonopah. <laughs> Even in little bitty Tonopah, we went through three sales managers. Let me finish. Even you, 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 you have to go through educating your hotel managers year after year, even if you're staying in the same hotel. Yeah. Well, they don't have to be hotel managers. They can be hotel staff. Yeah. 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 Was that in the Provo Marriott? And I said, oh yes. And she goes, oh yes, I was working there before COVID at the Marriott Hotel on Life, the universe, and everything's imposing. And I said, well, we're just like that, basically. And so, you know, we are lucky that we've had this 30 years of history where we've been in this effort. The last Conduit 25 was in the same hotel. And for people who are going to a new site, and they don't have the histories in that city or with those convention hotels, that would be a lot harder. Ben Yellow has been attending more, has probably attended more Western Cons than anybody alive at the moment. <laughs> and uh, he's, he's got his, he had his hand up there. Go ahead and make your case, Ben. Now, you have some, I don't necessarily agree with Ben's points yeah, today, but sage advice. Sage advice here. Um, two things. First, to directly address what. Why don't you use the microphone, Ben? Yeah, Ben, yeah, that's a good point. Ben, come up here, please, because take his no, there's microphone. A, there's a microphone there. There's one here. Yeah, that's fine. That's good. Um, a couple of things. Uh, to directly address what Linda and Charles have been mentioning, the meeting industry is really rather small. Uh, there are remarkably few people who actually are lifers in this business. And if you spend any degree of time working, you will encounter people again and again and again. So that history is available. What you just have to do is keep track of it. Keep track of your hotel liaisons. Talk to other people and find out Oh yeah, you remember Charlie, he was over at this Hilton uh, 20 years ago. And take advantage of that. Um, the second thing that i sort of like to address is one of the difficulties that Westercons have more than many of the other rotating conventions, because I completely agree with what Kevin says, rotating conventions are always harder, um, is establishing a, 
an identity for the convention. We know what a world con is. It has a pretty well established identity. Every world con is going to be different. Absolutely. But there is sort of a general feeling of what a world con is. You've got a smoth con, and again, it rotates all over the world, and everybody sort of knows what it is. But you've got a convention like Deep, Deep South Con, which sometimes, um, as we now may be able to start doing, Deep South Con sometimes is a standalone convention, sometimes it's a combined with other conventions. But it's able to do that because DSC is part of a Deep South Con culture. Southern fandom has its own identity. And so if you're at a DSC, you sort of know what to expect, whether it is combined or uncombined. What makes WesterCon in particular difficult is that Western fandom never grew up as a Western fandom culture. You, don't, you had separate cultural centers springing up and while, yes, you can make an argument that much of the Northwest came out, much of the Northwest culture started to come out uh, as a result of uh, first Vancouver WesterCon. And if you'll notice, conventions like Oricon and Norwestcon are all about the same age because they all got started by people who went to the absolutely marvelous first Vancouver WesterCon and who said, I need to do one of these at home. Um, Very different from the, uh, the later Vancouver one, by the way. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which did almost the opposite. <laughs> um, but what makes WesterCon particularly hard is that it's hard to establish, there is no WesterCon identity in the way that even the other rotating conventions have. And one of the things that keeps the other rotating conventions going is that even though the next SMOFCON, WorldCon, whatever, is going to be very, very different, <coughs> I mean, next year's DSC will be very, very different from last year's DSC. I can absolutely guarantee it. But West, but they still both will feel like DSC. And it's hard to, the thing that keeps rotating conventions in particular going through all the changes that they have to do is that there's a common identity and WesterCon WesterCon used to establish that because everybody from the West Coast used to go to WesterCon. Uh -huh. So when it was 2,000 people, it didn't matter where you were coming from. You were going to see 2,000 people coming from all over the West Coast. But when your convention is three or 400 and mostly drawing from a much smaller pool, it's harder to keep that identity going. Yeah, I agree completely. It is a difficult culture to look question. And, and even though we, as a, uh, a technically, we started the process to, I, I'm going to stick, I'm not calling you again on this. We've only got a few more minutes left. Even though uh, we have made some changes technical, we started them that might give a chance to, to, to reinvigorate the convention, but I, Perfectly acknowledge this might not work. We we may do it. There, I know. I none of the people who are strongly opposed to the. I mean, in the sense of kill it, kill it, kill it right now, put it dead, shoot it. None of them are here. You, you know, you're not, but the point is, I, mean, I, don't think so. I know you think it ought to be, but you're, you're you know, I'm, I'm willing to say I'm gonna, yes. The answer is yes to your question. I'll tell you is. Let's give it, I'm going to say, let's go ahead and take a chance on this. But if this doesn't work out, even I will hold and say, okay, this isn't going to work. Let's, it's up to us as a fandom, and, and to not just the people in this room, but the people you know, to, uh, to get it going. Well, um, as a person who used to be on the board of directors of uh, 
lots of skills. One of the guys, although they do not want anything to do necessarily with the convention itself, they do own the uh, service. Service, board. yeah, service. Board. Um, so the question will be their decision. It doesn't necessarily mean if, if they take WesterCon down for a couple of years to build back interest, make it stronger, that it won't ever come back because they want it to exist. What, what will happen probably, if that unfortunate thing does happen, is that um, new blood, new, new people who want to uh, bring it back, the, the momentum would be higher and maybe more involvement and stuff to eventually bring it back stronger than it was before. At least that's the hope. Um, but it's more painful and it looks worse if we keep going on uh, year after year with no bids. It's, it, 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 it's going to say, well, nobody wants it anymore. No, people may just need a break from it for a short period of time. Doesn't mean that it needs to go away forever. Just maybe needs to be put to sleep for a couple of years before it gets revised. Okay, we're gonna. I'm gonna see if there's any more questions or comments on it. Got one here, but then we're gonna start to wrap this up in about ten yeah. minutes to do that. One last comment, and then we'll start to wrap this up. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't. Okay, we'll get you that. Okay. Yeah. Um, there, there's the, uh, also an idea of bringing in uh, pros from other outside. Besides, like, how many people know? Nicky, well, most do no ones, uh, the monkeys came, used to come to the office. Uh, you'd see him in the Celtic music room. Okay. Getting in him at convention would bring new other people. Can in I respond? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, yes. Sometimes those people want money. Mm -hmm. There is a reality. Yeah, and the reality is, they may love it, and they may come as, a, as an attendee, but if we want them to perform or be, yeah, exactly. If we want them to come and do panels and talk and whatever, ka-ching, ka-ching. Uh, and we can't afford to do We that. had that problem. Last, I believe it was either the last San Jose Worldcon or the one that I co-chaired, I can't remember. We had a certain professional musician there who was attending as a favor to a friend, as a private citizen, and no, they were not going to do performances. They were there to visit their friends, so we need to respect that as well. They're, all of these stars and so on, they're people too, and they may just happen to be fanish. Yeah, we know, mean, actually, we know, we know for sure that we are some of the more sort of fans. If you win the lotto, donate some of it to WesterCon so they can hire some. Exactly, people. yes, okay. Uh, actually, just a comment on uh, your tone of convention. Mm -hmm. We stayed at the Vespa. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I love that place. We had a coat cap that kept moving around in the room. It is a weird hotel. Okay. Yes, <laughs> I heard the baby crying in the elevator. Oh, okay. Yeah. But anyway. we ate several meals in their little, little restaurant. Yeah. And one of the days, if for some reason, I don't think they believed there was going to be a convention on the first day. There was that. We tried. Because yeah. there was one day that we went there, and I asked for a diet coke. And they said, we're all out of Coke. And I was like, okay. So Jim went up and I went to the car because we had a stash. We took, I think, two 12 packs or two 24 packs of Diet Coke and said, here. <laughs> there is that problem, and of course, that is actually more generically the challenge of all of the rotating conventions is that if there's no history, they don't know. That's right. And then I have it for DC, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Because we told all these vendors to all the different stores that yeah. every convention is coming in because they knew that the previous one had been canceled and they were dying for something to happen. <laughs> you know, we were in the Indian restaurant, we told the guy, the guy was like, go to the phone and start ordering food. That's good. I like it. When they, sometimes they learn, you know. Okay, we're in the last few minutes here. Uh, I, and, I already basically gave my summary, so I want to ask the others, and I'm going to start with them because we invited them up here, to give sort of a closing comment on the subject of the future of Western Con. Negative or positive, honestly. Go ahead, Ben. Um, I think the key to getting Western Con or really any convention 
to succeed, and rotating conventions are harder, is to establish a reason that people would want to go there. Um, when Kevin started, or even worse, when I started, because that was well before Kevin started, there was an easy reason to go there. This was the only place that you could go to meet people like us. Um, that is no longer true. We don't have a monopoly on the market anymore. We used to have a monopoly. Of course you came to your local science fiction convention. It was the only place you could meet us. Um, we are now competing with a zillion other opportunities to meet us, which means we have to be able to do something better than any place else that we are competing with, because if we're not better than the things that we are competing with, people will go to our competitors. Now, I'm not saying this is a commercial question of competitors. This is people have time and money, and they have to figure out where they will get the most enjoyment out of spending that time and money. And what we have to do is be something better than the alternative when we're trying to compete with people's time and money. And whether that's by establishing it, establishing a brand, establishing an identity is one of the essential ways that you can compete for people. Because if they don't know who you are, they're not going to come. Very well. Could we, maybe Charles, and then yeah, we'll like a couple minutes on as we wrap this up? Well, I wanted to address the question that Ben, while it was at WesterCon in Utah, we understand, you know, how are we going to sell this to California? I mean, why do they want to come to Utah? And there always seems to be like this sort of pool of WesterCon people, and then that gets turned into a WesterCon based on the people who show up as regulars the people show up as locals. Utah has a local fandom. And I would elaborate that by saying that our local fandom does very well. The, the big Comic Con fanics is well supported. The Lucky like Universe Everything Writer Convention is well supported. The anime convention is still running. And some of those fell out of the Conduit Convention because anime was in Conduit and they built their own convention. The gaming conventions are active now. They start, in some sense, out of conduit. So those niche conventions are doing well in Utah. And um, you have to understand that WesterCon is its own niche. And I think it's catering to sort of an older fandom that have run conventions. They want to get together and see each other and see a new city. And it's hard to build it beyond that unless you can use your own local uh, population. Tonopah was mostly Western regulars. Las Vegas was mostly Western regulars. And so it was smaller. And I think that element still exists. It is graying out. And it's, it's going to be hard to. <laughs> yeah, I think we, We're yeah, slowly that, going. That's what you're, OK, Arlene. OK. Um, very simply. You have a branding idea, bring it to this gentleman right here. He can implement it and make it institutional from convention to convention. There's a good chance of it, at least. Yes. You, you want WesterCon to continue? Help us with some ideas. If you know somebody who'd make a good panelist, tell the programmer or the chair or somebody. If you think that there's a location that would work better, again, bring it to this gentleman here. Uh, he, can, he can institutionalize that to the next group of people. The biggest thing we all need to do, if you can afford to go, unfortunately I can ask three, but if you can afford to go, buy the memberships. You know, worst case scenario, you pass it on to somebody else and sell it off. You know, that's the worst thing that can happen if you can't go yourself. But at least help support WesterCon 76. Buy a membership and make this next year's convention a success. Because by making it a success, you're proving to other people that WesterCon is a solid organization that can continue even though it floats from place to place and has different people running it from place to place. But 
there's an interest in it continuing. And then, and I already gave basically my statement, it's what you make of it. Help, if you want it to continue, it's actually, it's a self-made convention. Members have to help themselves. And if we don't, then fine, we just go ahead and retire to eat. There's, these are, it's, not, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but let's, let's see what we have to do with it. I thank you for coming here. I thank you for participating in this. This is part of an ongoing conversation, and I, I hope it won't be the last. Thank you all very much.